What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick Six Podcast. I am John Breach, and I am here with Tyler Sullivan. Uh, there is a funny thing about today's podcast. Will Brinson was actually supposed to be hosting it. He was supposed to be back from vacation. Uh, we thought maybe because he had to watch NC State lose in the Final Four that he just gave up on life, moved to the Caribbean, was going to stay on a beach for the rest of his life. That is not the case. He's stuck in an airport somewhere. Sully, have you ever been stuck in an airport? Uh, I haven't. I've almost missed a few flights, including my honeymoon. We almost missed our flight from d going to Rome, from Dublin to Rome. We had to physically sprint to down. We went to the wrong gate. We had to physically sprint down in the airport. It was it was quite the time. I almost left my wife in Dublin, which would have been totally fine, right? I think she would have been totally chill about it. But I'll say this. We're talking about Brinson may or may not be in an airport somewhere. Also, we talk about Brinson being a big NC State fan. What's today? Today is the start of the Masters. It's a, a massive day in golf. I'm on you, Brinson. I don't know if you're in an airport somewhere. If we can get if we can get eyes on him, if he's down at Augusta, I'd I'd be uh wouldn't be shocked. Well, in your defense, first Solly, when you when you get to the airport, it's every man for themselves. If you oh, got to get wrong. to your flight, you got to get to your flight. If your wife gets left behind, that is her problem. Uh, you just got to get on the flight, especially those international ones. You don't want to miss them. And you know what? I I absolutely believe that. I feel like Brinson may have missed his flight on purpose so he could sit in an airport lounge to watch the Masters if he couldn't get down to Augusta. He's probably, uh, if you see Brinson in an airport lounge, please take a picture and tweet it to us. Uh, so big NFL news today, Solly. It's my dad's birthday. I know you were probably thinking of something else. So happy birthday to my dad. He is 68. Bengals all-time leading scorer. Sully, what's your favorite Jim Breach field goal? Oh, yeah, I have many of them. All of them? I can, I, I can list all of them absolutely right now for you. So, yeah, no. Clear, <laughs> clearly, uh, happy birthday to the big man. I saw the Bengals actually tweeted at him, too, or tweeted a, a picture of him. So that was great. Yeah, it was nice of them to give him some social media love. All right, we do a big podcast today. We're going to talk about some regular actual NFL news. Like, we know both teams in the Brazil game. We saw Josh Allen, not Josh Allen, Josh Allen, but the other Josh Allen, Got a huge contract extension. Uh, and we even have some UFL tampering to talk about, which should be fun. And at the end of the podcast, really the big part of the podcast today is that we're going to go through all 32 first-round picks and rank the best ones ever. But before we get to any of that, uh, Tyler, OJ Simpson passed away on Wednesday. His family announced the news on Thursday. Uh, and, and look, this, if there is one man in the history of sports who has a complicated legacy, it is OJ Simpson, one of the best NFL running backs of all time. But of course, anytime you talk about OJ, you have to talk about the fact that he was charged uh, for double murder, that he is accused of uh, killing Nicole Brown system, Simpson and killing Ronald Goldman. And yes, he was acquitted there, uh, but later found guilty in a civil lawsuit. So when you think of O.J. Simpson, how do you think he should be remembered? Also went to prison. I mean, we're talking about obviously the double double murder and double homicide, but he also went to prison for armed robbery for I believe it was nine years or so. So you're right. A complicated person in you know American history, American sports history, NFL history. When you talk about how we should remember him, I think you can look at everything. You can say everything that you just said. One of the better running backs in the league's history, but also one of the biggest fall from graces in professional sports in American history as well. You're talking about somebody who was at the height of it, an actor, a you know, a, in a ton of commercials as a promoter. You have one of you know a pro football Hall of Fame running back, and then it completely falls to a, an alleged murderer in going to prison for armed robbery and, and all of those things that happened in between the white Bronco chase, just some huge moments in not just sports history, but in American recent American history. So you can just look at it as a totality of how do we remember him? One of the greatest figures of all time and or one of the more infamous figures of all time. One of the greatest fall from graces of all time. Yeah, and I think that obviously when you mention Simpson, if you're mentioning his NFL career, you have to mention his legal troubles and everything he went through. That's not yeah. fair to what happened to everyone else. It's not fair to Nicole Brown Simpson, to Ronald Goldman, not to mention that when you mention OJ. And I think one thing we saw today, for instance, the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame 
released a statement where they just basically shouted out OJ's accolades and what he did in the NFL, even mentioned that, hey, look, he had an okay post NFL career. And really, they omitted any of the legal stuff, which I don't think is the right way to do it. And so obviously, you know, the Hall of Fame is the Hall of Fame. They're not associated with the NFL. Technically, they're their own entity. Uh, and they usually make the right decision on things like that. But I thought that they didn't do they, they kind of went about it the wrong way today. Yeah, it just felt like you're saying bland and uh, I don't know if tone deaf is the right word, but clearly omitting kind of a big thing when we're talking about OJ Simpson, all of the, you know, off the field stuff. And I get it that they are an entity that is strictly looking at him as a player. I know you wrote the story that he's not removed from the Hall of Fame. I think some people might find that pretty interesting. The fact that he's not removed from the Hall of Fame, considering all of the tumultuous things around him post his playing career. But I, I do think that it's fascinating just, again, to look outward or, or kind of grand scheme things with O.J. Simpson and just say how big of a, of a figure he was. I was talking to Harry about this before we jumped on, and I was trying to equate it to somebody. I'm like, the fact that he was commentating on every commercial was such a, a charming figure in American sports and American consumption viewing. It's almost like he was like, you know, today's version of maybe like Peyton Manning or something like that. For people that are watching NFL broadcasts, watching television, Manning's in a bunch of commercials. He's doing Manning casts. And the fact that you had somebody kind of like that fall as far down as he did, I think is just, a, it's a remarkable turn of events in recent history. Yeah. And I would say if anybody is listening right now and they've never seen OJ made in America, the ESPN series, the 30 for 30, that's five parts. Definitely go out and watch that. It really encompasses everything that OJ was from his legendary football career, where he was the first running back to crack the 2000 yard mark. He did it in 14 games. Uh, he averaged just over 143 yards rushing that season in 1973 when he won MVP. And that's still the NFL record for yards per game. And, and so he had some huge years with the Bills, obviously, which is why he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And as you said, he got huge in movies. He was doing Naked Gun. He was doing Hertz commercials. He was literally everywhere. He was probably the most famous athlete in the country uh, just for being famous, even though he retired from the NFL in 1979. So we're talking 10, 15 years later, he was still extremely famous. Uh, and then obviously the fall from grace starts in 1994, uh, with the deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. So it, it really is. And you've mentioned, you've said the words fall from grace multiple times, and that's really what it was. And it just happened so quickly and it was so unbelievable. And I, I think the documentary really does a good job of capturing how America was and what everyone was going through during that trial. I mean, all eyes were on that trial. That Ford Bronco chase had some of the highest television ratings in history, every network cut to it. They cut away from the NBA finals. And so everybody knows where they were if they were alive. When the verdict was announced, it was just it's just so crazy uh, when you look at his life in total, just where it was and what it became. And it's weird, too, because, you know, somebody like me who, I, you know, I think a lot of you just mentioned it. He, you know, he was, you know, a player in the 70s. He won the MVP in 1973. I'm 30 years old, going to be 31 next month. I was born in 1993. The trial, I believe, started in 1995. I, you know, I was a young guy when all of, or I was a baby when all that was going on. I wasn't even a young guy to even kind of take that in right now. You know, me growing up. OJ Simpson was never the the NFL star running back. He wasn't even really the the pitch man or the the movie star. He was this guy that you know allegedly a lot of people believe, even though he was acquitted, murdered two people in, in was in a rather horrific fashion, and then kind of posted weird stuff all the time on the internet. Like if we're just being honest, that's kind of how I have consumed OJ Simpson in my life because I was I you know all of that stuff predates me so. It's just a it's he's an odd figure to tap into because it does span over multiple generations. For me, like I was saying, he's the guy that, you know, clearly had a, a, a crazy thing happen in the 90s. And, you know, he was acquitted and it was, a you know, an unbelievably polarizing trial. 
but to me, it's it's he's a dude that posted weird stuff on the internet, spent time in prison for nine years for armed robbery. Like that's the stuff that really kind of is at least more. I can remember that stuff more than obviously anything that happened when I was a baby. So it's he's just an odd figure to kind of pinpoint into history at this point. Yeah, and it's really crazy to me that you have O.J. Simpson who uh, obviously gets acquitted in of the charges, found guilty in the civil court, and was ordered to pay the Goldman family $33.5 million, ended up selling his Heisman Trophy for $255,000 to help pay that debt. And you look at everything in totality, and you would think, if you got off or something like that and you just got to go home and there's not really, obviously there's the financial punishment hanging over your head, but you're not in jail. You would just kind of go back and lead a quiet life. You would think. And as you mentioned, you have the arm robbery situation. He goes to jail for just over nine years in Nevada. And it's just like, what are you doing? OJ? Why are, why are you anywhere near anything that's breaking the law at this point? And it was so unbelievable. And then when he gets out of jail in 2017, you look at what how the NFL has kind of handled this and whether because they definitely don't celebrate OJ Simpson's legacy, which is probably the smart thing. But, you know, when they had the 100th anniversary season in 2019, OJ Simpson was on the 100th anniversary team. They're not out here celebrating OJ, but they're acknowledging that he's one of the best players in NFL history. So I think that it's it's just a touchy subject for the NFL. You know, they're not trying to ruffle any feathers. But again, as we said, you have to mention all the bad stuff with OJ before you can talk about the good stuff. Yeah, I've, and I think that that's fair. Like, it, it again, it is a tough needle to thread if you're the NFL. But, you know, I am somebody who thinks you should mention everything. You should not, you know, hide the, the dirty laundry in the closet, so to speak. I think that you can acknowledge that this person was a you know a very high you know high profile player in your league a very productive player one of the best players in your league at one point but also you don't have to you know have these you know grand goodbyes or in you know these you know I feel like I was wondering too like if the NFL has their NFL honors like is he like in the in memoriam like is that something that they do I'm, I'm sure that they probably will but it's just it, it's it's an it's a complicated thing for the NFL to try to maneuver, but I think that it's smart to it still acknowledge him, the good and the bad. Yeah, you don't just erase him from history. Sure. Uh, but man, what a person! And uh, you know, obviously, we're still talking about him today, uh, forty years after he played his last NFL snap. And it really is rather unbelievable just what his kind of life fell into after his career was over. All right, Tyler, now we're going to move on to talk about people who are actually playing football. We're going to talk about Josh Allen's new contract. We're going to talk about UFL tampering, and we're going to do all of that after the break. Every spring, we marvel at its majesty, a tradition unlike any other, the Masters. This weekend on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. All right, so we saw a few guys get hit with the franchise tag this offseason. One of them was Jaguars star pass rusher Josh Allen, not to be confused with Bill's quarterback, Josh Allen. I cannot believe – you would not believe, Tyler, how many people confuse that. I have gotten tweets uh, from people who were just – I'll mention Josh Allen from Jacksonville in a story, and they'll just say, are you an idiot? Josh Allen plays for Buffalo. And I don't even <laughs> respond – because it's like you feel so bad, you don't want to offend anyone, and just you send them a link to the roster and just be like, look, man, I trust me. There's a Josh Allen in Jacksonville, uh, but he signs a massive deal, five years. Uh, it can be worth up to 150 million if he hits every incentive. But the key part is that it includes 88 million dollars in guaranteed money. That is quite the contract for him. What do you think of this deal? Do you like it for Josh Allen? Do you like it for Jacksonville? I was going to say I feel bad for Josh Allen because he has the same name as the Buffalo Josh Allen. And when it's a quarterback, you're always going to you know take second fiddle to that. But you just listed, what was it, five years, $150 million, $88 million guaranteed? Yeah, I don't feel bad for the Jacksonville Josh Allen. He's doing quite all right. And, and you know, I think this is a good move for Jacksonville because they need – to you know, he's coming off a 17 and a half sack season, one of the better pass rushers in the NFL. And this is a team that needs to start disrupting the quarterback as, as often as they possibly can because this AFC South, for as much as we've dogged on it 
it feels like over the last decade or so, it's starting to be it's starting to be a formidable division. When you have C.J. Stroud that you have to deal with, Anthony Richardson, who is not going to be an easy guy to take down if he stays to his level, or what we think he could be as a quarterback in Indianapolis. And then with Will Levis, they have a ton of weapons there. You have Tony Pollard now. You have Calvin Ridley. You have DeAndre Hopkins. You're going to need to get into that backfield to disrupt Will Levis just as much as the rest of them, too. So if you're Jacksonville, you're looking at this division and say, how do we combat this new and improved quarterback play? Well, let's keep this guy around that had 17 and a half sacks a year ago. Yeah, you absolutely cannot let your star pass rushers walk. Uh, you just it, that's one of the most that is the most important position on defense in the NFL in this day and age. You have to be able to get off the pat, get after the passer. Josh Allen has proven he can do that. He's had at least seven sacks in four of his five NFL seasons. And as Tyler mentioned, including that 17 and a half in 2023, kind of a breakout season. Uh, but, you know, he had 10 and a half as a rookie. So he's really put together uh, five good years, definitely deserving of this contract. And, and so I, I think this is a good move by Jacksonville because now you don't have to worry about where what you're going to do next year. Uh, you don't have to play the tag dance again. And you got your best defensive player under contract. And, you know, Josh Allen, you got $80, $88 million in your bank account. So this is obviously a good move for you. And, you know, one other thing that's confusing about him and Bill's quarterback, Josh Allen, is that they were both seventh overall picks. Couldn't the other Josh Allen have been like an eighth <laughs> overall pick? You have Bill's Josh Allen, who was seventh overall in 2018. Jags Josh Allen, who was seventh overall in 2019. It is just so confusing, right? You know what the more confusing thing is, is is when you go on like pro football reference to try to find the play. They don't have the position next to them. So it just says Josh Allen X year when they entered the league to, you know, present or whatever. So, yeah, I probably should know exactly when Buffalo Josh Allen entered the league and Jacksonville Josh Allen entered the league. But sometimes you get confused. And when you're looking up Josh Allen, whichever Josh Allen you want stats, you end up on the wrong one. So I would wish pro football reference, you know, this is a small, small gripe for us football writers, but if you could just put their positions next to the name, we wouldn't run into that problem. Yes. And, and very small gripe because pro football reference is an amazing a plus. website. And a once plus. you get to, once you click through to the player's name, the position is right there. Just yeah. not when you're uh, looking for it. All right. And so that leaves us with two players. Antoine Winfield Jr. and T. Higgins as the only franchise tag, tag players who do not have a long-term deal yet. So I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Who do you think gets a deal done first? How do you think these two situations play out? I think Antoine Winfield Jr. gets extended first. There's already reports that they were optimistic that they were, you know, both sides, the Buccaneers and, and Winfield were able to come to some term, some type of an agreement, whether that's, you know, an earth shattering market setting deal. I guess that remains to be seen, but it feels like there's more momentum in that camp than there is with T Higgins. I mean, you could speak to it a little bit more, but obviously the dude requested a trade. So it seems a little bit more tumultuous with him in Cincinnati. Now, I think the NFL draft is going to be really interesting because if these teams that want a wide receiver aren't able to get theirs, does that lead to a potential trade on day two? And maybe that's, you know, you, you were talking about a first round pick. Uh, it's, you know, could that be a next year, 2025 first round pick or something along those lines? I just think the NFL draft is going to be really interesting for T Higgins for Winfield. I feel like it's almost a matter of time before he and the Bucks come to terms on a deal. Yeah. That seems like something that might even happen before the NFL draft. Cause if you are the Buccaneers, you want to know going into that, do we need, the, do we yeah. need to replace him? Do we need to look toward the future or are we going to get Winfield on a contract for the next four or five years? Uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see that happen in the next two weeks before April 25th when the draft kicks off in Detroit. As for T. Higgins, man, I don't know how I feel about the situation. I, I will be surprised if he gets a long-term deal. I will be surprised if he gets traded. I think this will turn out like a Jesse Bates situation where he plays on the franchise tag and then maybe walks after the upcoming season. But as you said, the draft really is the key here because if if the Bengals get an offer, they can't refuse. You, you know, you said it. If a team needs a receiver and they don't get the guy they want, so now they're thinking, oh, maybe we need to call Cincinnati about T. Higgins. Do I think that the Bengals will say yes anything that doesn't involve a first-round pick? Probably not. But if you throw in a second-round pick and a player, that could change things. So there is definitely a dynamic that, that 
could switch that up, but I do think it will take a hefty offer to pry T. Higgins away from the Bengals. Um, all right, we're going to talk about kickers because that's my favorite topic. Harry knows it. You know it. And uh, Harry put it in the rundown. And the reason we're talking about kickers is because Jake Bates is a UFL god. Uh, we saw him this past weekend. He hit a 62-yard field goal. That was one week after hitting a 64-yard field goal. He is now just the second kicker in the history of the world to make a 60-yard field goal in consecutive weeks. How crazy is that, Solly? That's, I mean, you're the kicking expert. That sounds pretty crazy, but I need you to confirm. Yeah, no, that is absolutely bonkers. I mean, that's something that I, I just never thought I would see. Brett Maher did it in 2019 with the Cowboys, and no one's done it before that. No one has done it after that until uh, our guy Jake Bates did that. So now after Bates hit the six, you know, teams took notice after the 64 yarder. They said, oh, all right, our radar is on. We see this guy. That's huge. Now he comes out and hits a 62 yarder. Now NFL teams are just like moss to the flame here. And Mike Nolan, the coach of the Michigan Panthers, that is Jake Bates' team, basically came out and said, hey, look, teams are contacting him. Uh, and guess what? Jake Bates is under contract with the UFL. Jake Bates is not allowed to sign an NFL contract until the UFL season is over. And because he's under contract, NFL teams are not allowed to directly contact Jake Bates uh, about a contract. They're allowed to call the Michigan Panthers and say, hey, uh, you know, they can ask questions about Jake Bates through the Panthers, but they cannot directly contact him. So. I, I, do you think that makes sense, first of all, because it's like the UFL. If you're in the UFL, you want to play in the NFL. Do you think that rule makes sense, or should it just be the NFL can call you if they want? I, I think that – I don't think it makes sense. I think if if you're a kicker, you're a player, you're anybody in this league, you're not in it to be in the UFL. You're in it to go to the NFL. That's the whole point. You're putting together good tape. You're putting situations to hit 60-plus yard field goals so that these NFL teams then take notice of you and try to, you know, obviously acquire your services. So this is where I think the, you know, go to the USFL, the XFL, the UFL now, this is where I think they get it wrong. And this is where I think that they still need to figure, fine tune whatever this spring league is that they want to try to establish. You need to connect it to the NFL. You have to have it be something of an NFL entity, even if it's just kind of a, a side thing. It's not officially linked with the, with the NFL, but it still needs to be somewhat linked. So that when these things happen, you can get to know a player in the UFL. And then all of a sudden he joins your team and, it, and they're actually contributing to that team in the NFL that following season. So then me, an NFL follower, will take a little bit more stock into these spring leagues because it could be a breeding ground for co contributors to my NFL team. Like that, they need to find a way to link the NFL teams and the NFL product to the UFL. Right now, it just feels like they're trying to get into their, their own way. Right, and almost make it like a minor league of sorts. Yeah. But I will say that this has given the UFL a lot of publicity that they probably would not have given sure. because uh, the fact that anyone in America might know a UFL kicker's name is shocking. If you would have told me that in February that some of the country would know who Jake Bates was, I would have thought he had a 70-yard field goal. And he has come close to that. And I love that Michigan Panthers coach is a former NFL head coach. Mike Nolan was obviously with the 49ers. Uh, and so it will be interesting to see what he does because there is no doubt he is going to get a training camp invite once we get to uh, the end of the UFL season in June. But obviously, you still, if you're a special teams coach, there are going to be things you want to see. For instance, is he going to be accurate on short kicks? Only played one game. Uh, he went to training camp with the Texans in 2023. Only kicked in one game. He missed an extra point. Uh, and then you also want to see how he kicks outdoors because both of his field goals have been indoors at Ford Field. He doesn't play an outdoor game till week five. And the UFL, we're heading into week three. So there's just a lot of questions that still need to be answered. But he will certainly get a, a tryout. Now, let me ask you this, Tyler. This is, it seems like there's a new spring league every year and finally we have the xfl usfl combined into the ufl uh have you watched any games what do you think so far i was just gonna say i'd be lying to you if i said i've been sitting down every weekend watching games i mean it's the off season where nfl you know writers and and all of that so is if i don't have to watch the ufl then i won't but if <laughs> i'll see i'll see it online i'll see clips and things like that and 
to me, the reason why I haven't invested fully in the UFL, U, UFL yet is because, as you mentioned, there's been so many spring leagues and you get to like week five of the thing and all of a sudden you find out every no one's getting paid. The paychecks aren't going through. It's bankrupt and the league folded. So I, you know, I remember watching the XFL when it first came back and in and, and, and showing some interest into these spring leagues because I do think that there are good stories to be told where there's a kicker hitting a 60-something yard field goal and he goes to the Dallas Cowboys and he helps that team out the following year. I think that there are good narratives to come from these spring leagues, but they've been so inconsistent, their inability to stay relevant, and it, right now, I mean, we're just talking about it, they're not really creating a clear pathway to the NFL. It's just hard to invest in. And for somebody, you know, let's just use us for an example. Bengals and Patriots followers, it's tough to have a link to a team that's not in New England, not in Cincinnati, and there's really no tie. Like if, if you know, Bailey Zappi went down there and was starting to play for them, okay, fine. Like, you know, if he needs the reps or if there's a young quarterback there that's linked to my organization but needs some more playing reps that he didn't get during the NFL season, all right, fine. I'll watch him play for the Alabama Rough Riders or whoever the team is. But outside of that, it's tough to, for me to identify and to have any sort of connection with these teams because one, I don't know they're, if they're going to be there. And two, I don't know how it helps my NFL franchise. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You use that exact sample example of uh, someone like a quarterback from your team going to one of these teams because Bengals fans probably remember AJ McCarron. Uh, oh, he started a playoff game the year Andy Dalton got injured and AJ McCarron now plays for the St. Louis battle Hawks. So I do think that there are situations like that where you're thinking, you know what? I do want to see how he does because I liked him when he was on the Bengals. It was harmless. He was backup quarterback most of the time that he was here. And so I, I do think situations like that help. And it will be – we'll see. You know, if they last a couple seasons, that's really what they need to do. Just kind of prove that you can last more than one or two years, and, and that's how you build a fan base. All right. Let's get to uh, – let's leave the UFL and go back to the actual – NFL. We act, we had some news this week, Sully. We had some news. We found out who the Eagles will be playing in Brazil. It is the Green Bay Packers. So we have a game in week one. It's on a Friday. It's only on Peacock, and it's Packers-Eagles. Do you think that this is the NFL's way of kind of – do you think we're going to see more specialty games in the international markets or just specialty games overall? Uh, and then the NFL is just kind of testing the waters here. No, of course we're going to see. This is a money-making opportunity for the NFL. So certainly the NFL is going to explore this as much as humanly possible. Now, if they start not making money, well, then they'll go back to doing something else. I mean, we were talking about this with Christmas. The ratings have been so good. So they're going to double and triple and quadruple down. And you're going to see the same thing with these international games. If they start, if they are making money and they're drowning attention, not just in the United States, but internationally, well, then of course they're going to, you know, put every, you know, they're going to try to have all of these international games. Now, I don't think that they're going to say, you know, like they do with London. All right, Jacksonville, you're out there for three weeks. I don't think we're doing that in Brazil quite yet, but you're going to see these one-off games in Brazil, in in Mexico. You know, we've seen we've already seen them start to go into these different markets, whether it be Germany or you know you, we're, you're seeing all of these teams linked to different countries in terms of what they can market. They're already pretty much there. I, I think we're only going to see more of it as the years go forward. Well, the other thing is by introducing this kind of weekday week one game that's not the Thursday opener is you can really put that in anywhere. I mean, now you open the door for a game in Australia as long as it's week one because you don't have to worry about the travel back because teams will have eight or nine days off before their next game. Uh, I, I mean, and that's literally, you could put this opening yeah. week game anywhere in the world, although the NFL cannot play on Friday in week one every year because it all has to do with uh, where Labor Day falls. They can only do it when it's the first, when the first week of the NFL season is the first weekend of September. They can do that Uh like it is this year. Uh, and you know, another interesting thing about this game is that Mark Murphy, the Packers president was literally talking about how uh, he has travel concerns and the fact that they might have to have a layover to get NFL teams. Don't do layovers. It's nonstop for everyone. Uh, you know, they, uh, I'm sure you had a layover too on your honeymoon. NFL teams don't do that. So they're gonna have to bust to Milwaukee uh, to get to South America or possibly have a layover. And that's because the airport in green Bay can't handle the size of plane it will take to fly the 10 and a half hours 
to Sao Paulo. So is that crazy? Like, you, again, when we're talking about picking these teams, you think that, like, logistically, that would be one of the conversations that you might have. Like, hey, can the team actually get down there? I don't know. I, maybe I'm crazy, but I think I would want to see if that's humanly possible. It, it is funny, obviously. You know, Green Bay, That's it's it's a unique town. It's a unique circumstance to have a pro football franchise there. Obviously, we all know the history and stuff like that. It's just funny to see one of the more storied franchises having to schlep on a bus to go to Milwaukee to then head down for the international game. But but I did want to mention this quickly as we're talking about this game and it will the NFL, you know, continue to do this. I, I think the proof is in the teams that they're putting in these games. Look at this game in particular. This is a great game. The Green Bay Packers versus the Philadelphia Eagles, a, a Packers team that has a young quarterback on the rise in Jordan Love that was on the doorstep of going to the NFC Championship a year ago. The Eagles, who were just in the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, and yes, did have a fall from grace at the end of last season, but still has a ton of star power and an MVP candidate quarterback in Jalen Hurts. Like They're not doing like the old school Thursday night football thing where they're color rushing it against the Titans and Jaguars. Like it's, we're talking about legitimate NFC contenders on this type of a stage. So I think that that's a tell too, that they are taking it extremely seriously to put marketable teams in these venues. Yeah. And it will be interesting to see how much the Brazilians embrace this. We know when the first game was in Germany, it was absolute nuts. Tickets sold out in like 10 minutes. They went on the secondary market for, they were marked up 10 times the price. I mean, it was wild. Tickets have not gone on sale for this game, but I'm guessing they will sell out quickly. Sully, are you planning to go to South America for this game? Do we need I, to put our request in now? Go. I will absolutely put in the request to go. I will see you down there. It'll be great. <laughs> All right. We are going to close out today's podcast with a nice long conversation by ranking all 32 picks in the first round, the best ones of all time. And we're going to do that when we come back. I am a prisoner of this hotel. Why do they let you live? You must never leave. They can take away everything. They can't take away who you are. So when it comes to the NFL draft, people love talking about draft busts all the time. We're not doing that today. We're doing the opposite of that. Literally looking at the 32 best players, one from each slot in the first round. Uh, and we are going to go straight down the draft order and pick the best player ever that has been drafted in that slot. And if uh, my explanation sounded confusing, let's do it. Let's start off with the number one overall pick. Who is the best player to ever be taken number one overall? Here's a few options. Peyton Manning. John Elway, Bruce Smith, Terry Bradshaw, Chuck Bednarik. And you can, you don't even, have, those are just some options. You don't have to name any of them. Give me what you got. I, I think I would go Peyton Manning here. I think that's the, it's, it's, it, it, to me, it seems like the clear cut answer. Obviously, no disrespect to John Elway. Not, Terry not OJ Simpson? But, no, not OJ Simpson. I don't think, that, you know, uh, I don't think that that one really makes the cut. But Peyton Manning, to me, he, you know, he reminds me of kind of like LeBron James in the sense that there was so much hype with him. And you almost think that, like you were just saying, all these drafts are always bust. It's never going to work out. He's somebody that came into the league and lived up to the hype. He is someone who is established himself as one of the top five greatest quarterbacks of all time, if not the top three greatest quarterbacks of all time, multiple times Super Bowl champion, a ton of NFL records. It's weird because he played in the same era as Tom Brady that we consider the greatest of all time. But still, to me, you draft this guy being number one overall, hoping that he would become Peyton Manning, and he did. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a guy who won five MVPs. That yeah. it doesn't get any better than that. You're the best player in the NFL for five years. If not more than that, you just didn't win MVP every year. Uh, Two-time Super Bowl champion, went to the Pro Bowl 14 times. His accolades are just, we could literally have a four-hour podcast just talking about Peyton Manning's career. It was so insanely good. And then for him to kind of have that second resurgence in Denver, coming off the neck surgery, going out second year with the team, throwing 55 touchdowns and setting the NFL record for most touchdown passes in a season. That was pretty crazy to see that. And the, the NFL record for most passing yards in a season. So doing it at two stops at such a high level, uh, I think the easy answer is Manning, unless you want to give it to 1973 number one overall pick, John Matusak, who 
played Sloth in the Goonies. Did you know that? I did not. I knew. I didn't know where you were going to go with that, but uh, of course, that is that is a nice little bonus. So we'll we'll definitely we'll definitely take that into consideration. What a crazy! That, that's a fun fact. That <laughs> a number one overall pick who was not known for being a number one overall pick, uh, just Sloth from the Goonies. Um, all right, let's go to the number two overall pick. It feels like this one could end up being a defensive player. I feel like we'll agree here, and I do agree with Peyton Manning there. Uh, all right, here's a few options, and obviously, you, again, you can go off the board, go totally wild card, and pick whoever you want. We got Lawrence Taylor, Julius Peppers, Sid Luckman, the only franchise quarterback in Bears history, Randy White, Marshall Falk. Who do you think is the best number two pick of all time? A lot of good options here, but when, when you are spoken about as the greatest player on your side of the ball of all time and in Lawrence Taylor – it's hard for me to go against that one. Like, you know, I, I get it without, with these other, you know, very worthwhile candidates, but you're talking about somebody who was the face of the New York Giants, the face of the NFL, one of the greatest defensive players of all time. Somebody who Bill Belichick has talked about in the same breath as Brady, if not like more highly than Tom Brady. So that's the type of person that we're talking about in Lawrence Taylor, just an absolute menace. I, I think that if you were drafting a defensive player, you are hoping that you get half of Lawrence Taylor. And the fact that the Giants were able to use the number two overall pick and get him there and get that type of player is, again, just unbelievable. Yeah, I think the Bill Belichick thing is the thing that gets me. He's the smartest defensive coach in NFL history, I think. And if he says Lawrence Taylor is the best player, best defense player ever, then Lawrence Taylor is the best defensive player ever. And you can't really argue that. So, I would also go with Lawrence Taylor. I, you could throw Eric Dickerson's name there. I didn't mention him. Uh, there are a bunch of options, but when we have a two-time Super Bowl champion and a big reason those Giants teams won was because of their defense, Lawrence Taylor went to uh, 10 Pro Bowls, three-time defensive player of the year. I think it's him, J.J. Watt, and Aaron Donald, the only three players in NFL history who have won that award three times so it is oh, pretty hard to argue with that all right let's go to third overall this could be the first one where we disagree but it might not we might just keep agreeing we're going to find out right now here is a short list of guys at third overall we have barry sanders we have cincinnati Bengals legend super legend anthony munoz we have larry fitzgerald merlin olsen and joe thomas so let, can we guess where you're going to go? Do you want to go first on this one? Uh, no, you got to go first. I, I don't want to be, I don't, I, I, I don't want to cloud your judgment. I don't want to sway you either way with my convincing argument. Uh, you go first. To me, I like Barry Sanders and that's more just of a personal preference. A, a human joystick, former MVP, led the NFL in rushing four times. One of the greatest running backs of all time. And to me, just one, and one of the more exciting players, like, you know, this is before viral. This is before, you know, things blowing up on the internet, certainly during his playing days, but it almost feels like anything that he did went viral. If that's weird to even say, like he's such a dynamic and electric player to me that I just, I would put him as the, if I'm drafting a running back again at number three, I'm just using this as kind of my barometer. If I'm drafting a running back and he becomes Barry Sanders, massive win. Yeah, this was, I feel like I should go Barry Sanders and not homer it up here by taking Anthony Munoz. But Munoz is, I think when you talk to most offensive linemen, he's widely considered the greatest left tackle in NFL history, which is we're talking about the all-important position yeah. on the offensive line. Ten-time Pro Bowler, uh, uh, or maybe double-digit Pro Bowler, 11-time Pro Bowler, nine-time All-Pro. The man was all pro nine times, which is about as high of an honor as you can get. And he did something Barry didn't do, which was get to a Super Bowl, played on two Super Bowl teams. So uh, can I hand a tie vote? Can I give it to Munoz and Barry Sanders? Yeah, you're doing the heavy lifting today because Brinson's watching the Masters. So you oh, do what you man. want. That's, see, it's easier when there's three people here. <laughs> but my tie vote means Barry wins one and a half to 0.5. So... Uh, Barry barely gets the nod there. All right, let's get to pick number four. And look, there's you look at this whole list, there's great names at every number. Uh, fourth overall, Walter Payton, John Hanna, Mean Joe Green, Otto Graham, Charles Woodson. Who do you think it is? 
I mean, this, I feel like this is the most stacked one that we've had so far, right? Like it, it to me, it's crazy. It, it, I, I will go, I will, I will make the case, the Homer case for John Hanna. If we're, if we're doing greatest players of all time at their respective positions, yes, obviously a guard, but back in the day, that is, you know, or, you know, in his time was the greatest offensive lineman in the league and has been dubbed in, in some, in some circles, the greatest offensive lineman in NFL history. It's only a few years ago where the Baltimore Ravens were able to break the team single rushing record that was held by the Patriots and kind of spearheaded by John Hanna. So, you know, to me, if we're going to go, you know, positional greatness, if we're going to factor that in here, Hannah's probably in there as well, but producer Harry's freaking out to us in the, uh, in the chat there. So Otto Graham might also be in there as well. <laughs> we, we do not need uh producer Harry freaking out. We hate, we hate to see that. We hate to do that to him. Uh, I, I think that I am going to have to go with Walter Payton. Uh, just look, arguably the greatest running back in NFL history. And, and you know, I, I think I was alive for or even remember him playing maybe one season, two season. But like you said with Barry Sanders, it, he's that back where all these plays would have gone viral nowadays just because of how smooth he was and how well he ran. We saw him lead the NFL in rushing uh, in 1977. We saw him win the MVP in 1977. It is hard for a running back to do that. Uh, and of course, won the Super Bowl with the 1985 Bears. So we have Tyler going with John Hanna. I'm going with Walter Payton. All right, fifth overall, we got some Deion Sanders. We got some Junior Seau, Mike Haynes, Ladanian Tomlinson, Steve Van Buren. You know, L LT was one of my favorite players, you know, when I was growing up, like fantasy football, absolute stud. But I don't know if I can shy away from Deion Sanders here. I mean, just you talk about iconic players in the NFL, a, you know, former defensive player of the year, just an absolute stud all the way around on multiple different levels, obviously in special teams as well in the return game. So to me, I think Deion Sanders is probably the pick here. Yeah, I feel like this is an easy one. Yeah. Eight-time Pro Bowler, won two Super Bowls. I mean, he was basically uh, Darrell Revis before Darrell Revis was Darrell, Darrell Revis, where he just, uh, after he left the Falcons, it was, I'm going to sign with the team that gives me the best chance to win and pays me the most money. Ended up playing with the 49ers in 94, then went to Dallas uh, for a few years. And look, like you said, just it's hard to argue against Tion. Probably the best cornerback, best cover corner. Uh, and punt returner. I mean, he was prime time for a reason. So I think we agree on this one with Deion Sanders. All right, number six. Woo. We got some big names here. We got Jim Brown, Sammy Baugh, Walter Jones, John Riggins. Give me, give me some six overall love. I think I go Jim Brown. I think I go Jim Brown here. You're talking about one of the, again, one of the greatest running backs of all time, a three-time NFL MVP. It's To me, it's just the, the amount of, you know, the production, 1950s, six, uh, what is it, 1960s all-decade team, 75th anniversary all-time team, 100th anniversary all-time team. He's in the Browns ring of honor. He's got his number 32 retired. And I, you know, this is another one I remember, when you know you, you would hear you know Patriots going to Cleveland for games, and Bill Belichick would make it a point to have the team stop at Jim Brown's statue. Like there, there is such a you know, respect for that type of a player. So to me, I would go Jim Brown. Yeah, I think this one feels like a no-brainer. Uh, you know, you mentioned his accolades. He played for nine seasons. He led the NFL in rushing for eight of those. I mean, that is mind blowing to lead the NFL in rushing in all but one of your seasons in your career. And, you know, the three-time MVP that you mentioned, I think that is a solid argument in his favor. So, yeah, let's just move on because Jim Brown gets denied. Seventh overall, I feel like this is going to be up in the air. We've got Josh Allen listed here as an option, even though he's, you know, still playing and will still be playing for a while. Adrian the, the, Peterson. The Jackson, the Jackson. I know. Is the Jackson? I don't know. We don't. <laughs> Harry didn't specify, so we'll say either one. If you want to put Jacksonville, Josh Allen, you do it. Uh, <laughs> both. All right. Then we got Adrian Peterson, Champ Bailey, Sterling Sharp. Uh, who do you like? 
I, I mean, I think that there's, if, if we're being you know honest, I think that there's probably a chance that Josh Allen gets there, but we have to see his career play out, right? Like if he goes and on and wins a couple of Super Bowls, then sure. Okay, we could, we could talk about him in this regard. It just feels a little bit too early. I feel like he's like an MVP and two Super Bowls short for being in this conversation. I think Adrian Peterson is someone who probably should get some love here. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it probably is Adrian Peterson. You just look at what he did early in his career. The thing is, I feel like most people remember him as you look at the tail end of his career, basically from 2016 on after his suspension, and there just is nothing. He just wasn't the same player, and that's kind of the lasting memory that people have. But when you look at his Rookie year of 2007 up to 2015. I mean, he was so dominant. Led the NFL in rushing three times. Had a 2,000-yard season. Uh, so I think Adrian Peterson, and I think my wild card is a guy who was taken in 1958, and that is Hall of Famer Chuck Howley. One of uh, the very few defensive players to win a Super Bowl MVP, five-time All-Pro. So I would be fine with Adrian Peterson. I'm going to go Chuck Howley. Okay, fair enough. All right, we're going to eighth overall. We got Ronnie Lott, Lance Allworth, Jim Parker, Willie Rofe, Larry Zonka. Ronnie Lott to me, just, you know, I know that we talk about the 49ers with, you know, with Joe Montana and everything along, you know, Jerry Rice and those guys. But boy, Ronnie Lott, legit defensive anchor in that secondary four-time Super Bowl champion, eight-time first-team All-Pro. You know, he's led the league in, in forced fumbles and in interceptions at certain points in his career. I just think that, you know, we're talking about somebody who was, as much as we talk about Joe Montana and all those guys in San Francisco, he's on the defensive side, someone that shouldn't be slept on. Yeah, as someone who played on uh, the Super Bowl, he, he was drafted in 1981. The 49ers made the Super Bowl his rookie year and beat the Bengals. So I should be completely bitter about that, and I am. But look, Ronnie Lott was the best, of the best, one of the best defensive backs of his era. Went to the Pro Bowl 10 times. A big reason why that defense was good and why the 49ers won four Super Bowls while he was on the team. Uh, you know, another guy I like is Mike Munchak. He was taken eighth overall one year later, uh, Hall of Fame offensive lineman. So I would put him in the conversation, but I do agree with you. I think Ronnie Lott is the answer here. All right, let's go to the ninth overall pick. Man, we have a battle here. We have a battle. Bruce Matthews, Dick Buckkiss, Luke Keekley, Brian Urlacher, Lenny Moore. I feel like you almost have to go Dick Buckus here, or am I am I wrong? I, I you tell me. Two time Defensive Player of the Year, five time First Team All Pro. I mean, you know, again, one of the greatest Bears of all time. I feel like I'd go Dick Buckus. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I feel like I feel like I would go with that. I feel I feel I feel comfortable with that. I think it's crazy that the Chicago Bears picked. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? Is that crazy? Use the uh, or wait, wait, um, wait, wait. I, uh, I'm looking right now. Was was Buckus the ninth overall pick? I thought I got picked higher. I, I could be. Oh no, he got picked in the AFL draft ninth overall, but was third overall in the NFL draft. So we can. So technically, I guess we could put him at ninth overall. But if we're only doing NFL, I, I feel like Bruce Matthews. If we're only doing NFL. Yeah. And butt kiss. Hey, you get drafted by an AFL team, even if you never play for him. Does that still does that still count? <laughs> I don't know if that counts. Okay, we won't. I'm going Bruce Matthews then. That's fine with me. Or do you want you want to give some love to Keekley or Erlacher? I mean, you know, again, great linebackers. I mean, you know, this even even without buckets, this is a heck of a spot for linebackers at number nine overall. But no, we can go Bruce Matthews. That's totally fine with me. All right, let's go tenth overall. Marcus Allen. Rod Woodson, Terrell Suggs, Patrick Mahomes, Jerome Bettis. I, I, th I think this one is Patrick Mahomes. As much as I was just saying for Josh Allen, it feels like he's a couple Super Bowls away. He's still playing and all of that. This dude's already won multiple Super Bowls, gone back to back, won MVP. Like he is establishing himself. And, and you know, I, I wrote a story about it after they won the Super Bowl, just kind of looking at all the postseason statistics of where he already ranks. It's ahead of guys like Peyton Manning. He is rivaling 
the start that Tom, or he's pre, basically on track with what Tom Brady was able to do and in many respects has been better than Tom Brady at the start of his career statistically. So he is very much on track to be the greatest quarterback of all time. But already right now, if he retired tomorrow, he would, in my mind, be considered one of the seven best quarterbacks of all time, if not higher. Yeah, it, it blows my mind that he has been the starting quarterback for six seasons. And the Chiefs have made it to at least the AFC title game in all six of those Crazy. seasons. That's, That's nuts. It's, it's bananas. He's got his three Super Bowls, his two MVPs. That, I look. Still in the middle of his career, still in the prime of his career, but I think you got to go Mahomes. Yeah. Ooh, number 11. Ooh, this one's juicy. We got Frank Gifford. We have Ben Roethlisberger, Paul Warfield, Michael Irvin, and J.J. Watt. Whew, this is this is a good one. This uh, you know again uh, you know if you're the Minnesota Vikings maybe you just stay pat. You're 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 picking at number eleven. Seems like you'll get some some good players here at, at this spot. I, I think I go. I think I lean Ben Roethlisberger because I am just putting so much emphasis on quarterback. But boy, JJ Watt too. I mean that is. That is a tough one. That is a tough one. I think I lean Ben Roethlisberger, probably one of one more if he was in a different era, but I, I think I lean Roethlisberger here. What about you? Uh, it's tough. I mean, I could easily make the argument for J.J. Watt. Yeah. Uh, you could put him at number two on this list. You could put Frank Gifford at number one. You could put Paul Warfield at one. Or I mean, it, it, we're talking about Mike Orvin being the fifth best at this, and I think I agree with you. I'm going to go Roethlisberger. Uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm not being a homer just because I went to school with him. <laughs> I swear. All right. Shout out Miami of Ohio. Let's look at the 12th overall picks. We got Herb Adderley, Warren Sapp, Clay Matthews, Ali Nagata, and Marshawn Lynch. If we're going strictly on personality, which I, I know we're obviously not, it's Marshawn Lynch in a landslide because he is the funniest guy that's ever stepped foot on an NFL field. He's the he's he's my one of my favorite characters that the NFL has ever had to offer, but we're not doing it on, you know, how funny you are and, and how good of a sound bite you are. I, I, I think I go Warren Sapp here. Is, is that, where are you? Yeah. I, I feel like Warren Sapp feels like the answer. You look at what happened after the Buccaneers drafted him yeah. uh, in 1995. I mean, that team turned around, won a Super Bowl with them. And it, it, look, he put together a hall of fame career and really was the anchor of that defense for so long. And look, I think that Clay Matthews, you could certainly make an argument for him, but let's go with Sap. Okay, fair enough. So, sorry, Clay. All right, who we got? We're lucky 13, lucky 13. Oof. Aaron Donald, Bob Lilly, Tony Gonzalez, Franco Harris, and Mike Ken are your five candidates, but feel free, as always, to add anyone you want. I think I go Aaron Donald here, and and maybe that's a little recency bias, but we were we were talking when he retired. We were talking with with Brinson that this is you know one of the three best defensive players of all time. The fact that he was able to do to have so much production from even from just a, a, a very boring sack standpoint. If you just look at sacks, the way that he was able to disrupt from the interiors, and he's not an edge guy. He's an interior defensive lineman. The fact that he was able to have such an impact and did win a Super Bowl with the Rams and is considered to me to be one of the five best, maybe three best defensive players of all time. I, I think it's it's it warrants him to be the best player at number 13 overall. It's crazy because you also have Tony Gonzalez, who you could say is one of the five best yeah. tight ends. Franco Harris, one of the best running backs of all time. But maybe it is recency bias. Maybe it's because Aaron just retired. But I think you could even make the conversation he's one of the two best defensive players of all time. Put him up there with Lawrence Taylor. Uh, but I'm going to go with you here and agree that it's Aaron Donald. 14th overall, we got Jim Kelly, Gino Marchetti, Darrell Revis, Dave Robinson, and Randy Gratishar. And as much as I said, I put emphasis on positionals in the, in the quarterback, and so Jim Kelly probably would be the answer there. I, Darrell Revis, to me, is one of the greatest cornerbacks of all time. The fact that he was able to be so dominant – in an era where it was so pass happy and the rules are so slanted towards the offense, he is just in an all world type of cornerback and was making legitimate Hall of Famers look like like schoolyard boys. He is just to me. I think it's Revis and it's 
It's not that close, even though, again, Jim Kelly, a, a phenomenal quarterback. Uh, coming from the Patriots fan, hating on the former Bills quarterback. I am not surprised at all. I do like the Revis pick, uh, and I could absolutely see why you go that route, but I'm going to go with Jim Kelly. Look, once he took over as the starting quarterback, you look at that K-Gun offense did in Buffalo. Getting the four Super Bowls, I don't care if they lost them all. That is nearly impossible to do. It is impossible because no one else has done it, uh, although the Chiefs might end up doing it. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to go Kelly here just because what he did, what felt so improbable. And he ran that offense under Marv Levy so efficiently. All right, let's go to our 15th overall picks. We finally disagreed on one. That's a big one. That's All right, good. 15th overall. We got Alan page, Jim Taylor, Dennis Smith, Derek Johnson, and Delta O'Neill. You give me yours because I'm still Googling uh, half these names. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go with Alan Page. I think he feels like uh, the best option here. And I think this is the first one where the, you could really make an argument for a couple. But look, Alan Page is a Hall of Famer. We saw him win the MVP, one of the very few defensive players to do that. He won in 1971. And uh, he dominated for a long time. Like Aaron Donald, defensive tackle, spent most of his career in Minnesota. Uh, so I'm going to go with Alan Page. Fair enough. You still Googling? No, no, I'm good. I don't need to Google the next one. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think this one, there's good names, but I think this one's obvious. 16th overall, we have Jerry Rice. Do I need to keep going? or You, you do not. I will say, though, what a you know, still, Troy Polamalu, Zach Martin, Raymond Claiborne, Javon Kurse. Pretty good names there, but boy, when you have the greatest wide receiver of all time, kind of ends the conversation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it, man, it is still blows my mind that Jerry Rice fell to 16th overall. Uh, and you know what's a fun fact about that draft is that I believe 49ers actually tried to trade up with the Bengals to get someone else, and the Bengals refused to trade and so the 49ers got stuck, and I use my quote-unquote bunny ears, uh, with Jerry Rice. The Bengals had the 13th overall pick, and they took Eddie Brown that year. And then, of course, Jerry Rice wins Super Bowl MVP three years later in a win over the Bengals. So that one came full circle pretty quickly. All right, 17th overall pick. We have Emmett Smith. We have Mel Renfro, Gene Upshaw, Steve Hutchinson, and Louis Wright. Who do you got? There you go, Emmett Smith. Again, the NFL's all-time leading rusher. Yeah. Probably good for something. I think that does have to count for something. I'm going to agree with you there. I'm not I'm not going to battle you. His stats speak for themselves. All right, let's go 18th overall. We got Art Monk, Paul Kraus, Frank Kennard, John Henry Johnson, and Marquise Pouncey. Yeah, I go Art Monk here. Three-time Super Bowl champion, Hall of Famer. That that To me, that's relatively easy. Yeah, it does feel it, – it, it's crazy how productive he was – uh, during his time in Washington, playing with uh, multiple different quarterbacks. I mean, we we credit Joe Gibbs for winning a Super Bowl with, I, I think, three different starting quarterbacks. And you had Monk back there just catching passes from all of them, had over 100 receptions in 1984, uh, which, which is just crazy to think about back in the 80s. Uh, so let's go Art Monk. All right, 19th overall, we have Marvin Harrison, Randall McDaniel, Roger Worley, Joey Browner and Sean Alexander. Ooh. The answer to me is is Marvin Harrison, but let me just give some love to Sean Alexander, who was a beast in Madden 07 when he was the cover athlete, because that was one of my favorite video games of all time. And when he was rocking those those old Seattle uniforms before they went, you know, the Russell Wilson neon green ones, he was a beast. So I, I did like Sean, Sean Alexander quite a bit, but it, to me, I think it's Marvin Harrison. Yeah, Sean Alexander actually went to high school about 30 miles from where I grew up. So I got to see him play in high school a couple times and see him thrive like he did in the NFL. We saw him win the MVP in 2005 when Seahawks went to the Super Bowl, three-time Pro Bowler. Uh, but I do agree, as much as I love Sean Alexander, I'm going to go with Marvin Harrison. Uh, just, man, you know what? We might be talking about his son when we have this conversation 15 years from now. But it's hard to argue with what he did in his career. Three-time first-team All-Pro, eight-time Pro Bowler, and, of course, won a Super Bowl with the Colts. 
20th overall, we got Jack Youngblood. We got Forrest Gregg, Maxi Bond, Steve Atwater, and Bill Brown. Who do you like at 20th overall? Jack Youngblood, five-time first-team All-Pro, obviously Hall of Famer, L70s team. It's probably it. I will say this, though. Fun fact. I almost lean towards uh, Forrest Gregg only because my parents, when I was born, they were down to Tyler and Forrest. Those were the two names. No. So I could have been Forrest Sullivan. So I might, you know, that that's what's pulling me to uh, to Forrest Gregg. But I probably go Youngblood. I might have to call you uh, Forrest Sullivan for the rest of this podcast. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a couple 20th overall picks. My favorite 20th overall pick ever is a guy named Elvis Peacock. Uh, didn't. I just had to mention that Mark May was a 20th overall pick. We all know that name. He is now uh, in the media. And and what I think one thing about Forrest Gregg, though, that I like, uh, besides the fact that he played in the Ice Bowl, is that he's a former Bengals head coach, and he was their head coach in Super Bowl 16. So even though this is from a playing standpoint, uh, I would give Forrest Gregg my 1B, but I do think Jack Youngblood is the ultimate answer. All right, 21st overall. This is another one that there's some big names, but I feel like we're going to agree. Randy Moss, Lynn Swan, Vince Wilfork, Chandler Jones, and Alex Mack. To me, Randy Moss. I think that's, you know, it, it's it's similar to Jerry Rice. One of the best, if not, you know, talent-wise, the best to ever do it. His 07 season with New England was insane, but even before that, when he was with the Minnesota Vikings, what was I forget what the actual statistics were, but it was like three catches, 100 and something yards, three touchdowns. They always put that meme up when a receiver goes off on a weekly basis. The dude was just, he was an alien. He's an, he's an absolute freak and one of the best receivers of all time. He led the NFL in receiving touchdowns five times. Like that is bonkers. Yeah. That is just impressive. All right, we'll go Randy Moss at 22. I absolutely agree there. 22nd overall, we have Andre Risen, Harris Barton, Justin Jefferson. Ooh, that's sneaky. Jack Reynolds or Demarius Thomas. Like, what would it take for Justin Jefferson to, to ultimately be here? Like, you know, obviously he's already, in, you know, he's on the list. But what, like, how, like, how high does he need to go? Like, what else does he need to do? And he's only been in the league for a few years, already established himself as one of the best starts to a, to a career for a wide receiver of all time. But how much longer do we have to go until he gets into that Randy Moss thing where you're just like, yeah, no, of course it's Justin Jefferson. Uh, I mean, I feel like, let's see, he would have to go at least eight seasons. I feel like that's kind of yeah. the, he's only gone four. And I, I mean, you can certainly put him in this conversation because he has been so dominant. I mean, you look at, he's got over a thousand yards, four straight seasons and has been unstoppable, uh, even though the Vikings won't give him a new contract for some reason. Um, so, yeah, I think you could absolutely put Jefferson here if you wanted. Do you want to is the question. No, because, again, it just feels a little too early for me. Although, I don't know. I don't know. You, you, you'd be the tiebreaker on this one. I do like Demarius Thomas, but... Yeah, I like Demarius Thompson. You know who was a 22nd overall pick? I'm not going to put them on my list. Uh, William Refrigerator Harry. Perry. <laughs> the fridge. Man, the no. fridge. You know what? I'll go Andre Risen. He had That's a pretty fine. prolific career. He played for a bunch of teams. Won a Super Bowl, five-time Pro Bowler. But I think Justin Jefferson will ultimately end up being the answer uh, if we have this conversation uh, three years from now. All and right, 23rd overall. Yes, true. Ty Law, Aussie Newsom. Oh, I can't even talk anymore. Bill George, Ray Guy, Bruce Armstrong. Ooh. This is a good one. This is a really good one. I, I'm, you know, I'm trying not to be a homer here and, and lean towards Ty Law, even though he's one of my favorite Patriots of all time. Legit shut down corner. You know, they were changing the rules for him at certain points in his career. There, you know, he was that good. Spearheaded a lot of the Patriots early dynasty years. Is but is it am I foolish for saying him over Ozzie Newsom? I don't think you're foolish. I think you could certainly make the argument, and you just did. But I'm gonna go Ozzie. I can't yeah. argue against a Hall of Famer, uh, all 80s team. And guess what? You know, he's beloved in Cleveland. There are not many people, the Browns fans love. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm going Ozzie. Yeah, that's fine. That's totally fine. I'm sorry. Sorry. I see your Patriots banners. It makes me feel bad. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's, it's quite all right. Uh, all right. 24th overall. Uh, what do we got here? We have Aaron Rodgers, 
We have Ed Reed, Des Bryant, Calvin Hill, Cameron Jordan. How do you go from a couple of these picks, like 22, where you're, uh, I don't even know who I should pick there, maybe Justin Jefferson, and then you get the 24th overall, and you have a bunch of legends who somehow fell in the draft. I think all of these teams now should look at this list and then just trade to these selections, because clearly <laughs> this 11, is... Trade to yeah, 24. Why would you? Because this is where all the stars come from. This is, you have to, you know, yeah, it's boring to just get the number one overall pick. You actually want the number 24 overall pick if you're really galaxy branding this whole thing. I, I think this is a tough one because, you know, Aaron Rodgers is one of the best quarterbacks of all time, multiple time MVP, Super Bowl champion. But Ed Reed is that dude. He is one of the best defensive backs in NFL history. You know, you've heard Tom Brady, you've heard Peyton Manning, you've heard all of these guys say that Ed Reed was the toughest guy I've ever had to face on a week-in, week-out basis. I, I kind of feel like I lean towards Ed Reed. Yeah, look, I know that we look at the quarterbacks and we probably rate them a little more strongly because the position they play, they touch the ball all the time. You look at Rodgers, what he has done, four-time MVP. He won the Super Bowl back in 2010. And he has been absolutely dominant. But man, you can make the case that Ed Reed was the best at his position in his era. And as you, I mean, we've heard Belichick talk a lot about how that was the guy they had to look for when the Patriots offense was on the field. So I'm going to go with my half point system and give half point to Ed Reed and a half point to Aaron Rodgers. I'm splitting yeah. the vote. All right, 25th overall, Santonio San Holmes, John Beeson, Dante Hightower, Stanley Morgan, Ted Washington. You know, you got two guys here who have made iconic moments in the Super Bowl in San Antonio Holmes and Dante Hightower. And, you know, obviously you have that catch from Ben Roethlisberger with a few seconds left in that Super Bowl to help Pittsburgh win that game. And then you have Dante Hightower who had the strip sack of Matt Ryan in that 28-3 comeback. Also sneaky, had the tackle of Marshawn Lynch right before the Malcolm Butler interception. It's one of the more underrated stops defensive plays in Super Bowl history, in my opinion. The fact that you were able to stop that dude at the goal line, the play before the interception. Um, I, I, it's, it's, I, I, between the two, I, again, I don't want to be a homer, so I don't know. want to just say Hightower, but I felt like he had more moments in more championship games than Holmes. I love that every time Tyler has said, I don't want to be a homer. And then it proceeds to be a homer. Going full homer. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what? I'll agree with you. I do think, you know, obviously, San Antonio Holmes having that game-winning catch in the Super Bowl from Ben Roethlisberger to beat the Cardinals, and that is a pretty iconic moment. I think that's one of the best throwing catches we've ever seen in the Super Bowl, probably top five. But when you look at what he actually did, he only had, I, I think, one season over 1,000 yards, so he yeah. never blew you away with his number. So obviously, very iconic Super Bowl moment, uh, but I'll go with Hightower. All right, let's get to 26 overall. We have... Dave Brown, who another Clay Matthews, Alan Fanica, and uh, Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis to me, and I, th I think that's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have to have a very long conversation about this one. How did Ray Lewis drop to 26th overall? Uh, and again, it's one of those things where we just had this conversation at 25 where we're, we're pulling at straws here talking about Super Bowl performances because these guys aren't Hall of Famers. You get to 26, you have guys like Alan Fanica, Clay Matthews, Ray Lewis, it's just, it, it's crazy how the draft falls sometimes. All right, 27th overall. Again, this is a good example. Uh, Harry, our producer, just assuming our answer here as the resident Dolphins fan, and that's because Dan Marino was taken 27th overall. A couple other names, Roddy White, Devin McCourty, DeAndre Hopkins, uh, and D'Angelo Williams. I'm going with the Ace Ventura pet detective star, Dan Marino. Man, robbed of an Academy Award, didn't even get nominated. It's 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 a crime that I'm still not over to this day. Similar to Ray Finkel not getting over that kick. It is it, uh, just don't lock yourself up in Shady Acres Mental Institute, Tyler. That's all I ask. All right, 28th overall. There is no Dan Marino here. We have Mark Ingram, Joe Staley, Daryl Green, Derek Brooks, Trevor Price are a couple of the names. Who do you like? I mean. Uh... I think I, Joe Staley is someone who it just pops out to me, but I don't, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I think I'm going to go Daryl Green. I like okay. Joe Staley. I think you could easily say it's him, but Hall of Famer, one of the, the yeah. just his speed was unbelievable, running down guys left and right while playing for Washington. 
uh, for his entire career. I mean, we're talking his career spanned from 1983 to 2002. When you were in the NFL for 20 seasons and you're playing defensive back for all 20 of those seasons, to me, that is impressive. We're talking about seven-time Pro Bowler, won two Super Bowls in Washington, uh, and their defense was a lot better because of him. So he also finished with 54 career interceptions, which is the 21st most in NFL history. All right, 29th overall, we have Fran Tarkenton, Steve Wisniewski, Nick Mangold, Dave Wilcox, and Harrison Smith. Totally biased pick here. I interviewed Fran Tarkenton a long time ago, and he was super nice, so I'm going with him. Yeah, I think that is a fair pick. Uh, and you look at uh, Fran, and then you have Harrison Smith, who were both drafted by the Minnesota Vikings. So I think that is interesting. And another interesting fact about Fran Tarkenton is this. When he was drafted 29th overall, Solly, that was in the third round. He was a third-round pick. That's wild. My, that, how the times that, have changed. That is insane. <laughs> But yeah, he's got an MVP from 1975, nine-time Pro Bowler. So I think Fran Tarkenton is the answer here. All right, 30th overall. We got Sam Huff, TJ Watt, Reggie Wayne, Eric Allen, Keith Bullock. I don't think it's too early for TJ Watt. I know we've had a couple of these conversations with other guys, but I think TJ Watt is Hall of Fame trajectory, one of the best pass rushers of his generation in a time where, again, it's so much harder to make any sort of impact defensively. But what do you think? Yeah, I think it is fair because you look at the 30th overall picks that have been out there. And again, it blows my mind that he fell to 30th overall to the Steelers. But yeah, I think uh, I agree with you. This is one. We don't have a lot of recent guys that are still active on this list, but we're putting TJ Watt in that Mahomes mold. Of, you are still playing, but you are good enough to be considered the best ever in your draft slot. All right, number 31 overall, Cameron Hayward, Curly Culp, Tommy McDonald, Travis Frederick, Greg Olson. Is it too early for Cam Hayward either? I don't, I don't think so. I think he's I think he's in this conversation easily. Yeah, I think you could definitely put uh, Cam Hayward in there. I think the other person you'd probably consider is Tommy McDonald, Hall of Famer, who played way back in the day, uh, 1957, who was drafted with the Eagles. Another third-round pick uh, taken at 31st overall. So I'll go Tommy McDonald, but I think Cam Hayward is certainly – you could certainly make an argument for him. All right, 32nd overall. We are here, and there's some interesting names. We went through a few were maybe not so interesting. I think this is going to be a battle of the quarterbacks. We have Drew Brees. We have Lamar Jackson. We have Bob St. Clair, Logan Mankins, and Benjamin Watson. I think it's still as, as impressive as Lamar Jackson has been, obviously a multiple-time MVP. It's Drew Brees. You know, you're, you're talking about a guy that's won a Super Bowl, has you know uh, you know before Brady broke him had all the passing records it felt like you know he was as prolific of a passer great story too going from the Chargers to, after they were you know got Philip Rivers to the New Orleans Saints him and Sean Payton revitalizing that area after Katrina it just I love his NFL story and he's been one of the more prolific guys in a in that era so I would go Breeze. Yeah, and you look at Breeze, second overall in NFL history in passing yards, passing touchdowns, but zero MVP awards compared to Lamar Jackson's two. Um, so I do agree with you. I don't think Lamar's played long enough. What do you think Lamar would have to do and how long? Do you think we'll talk about Lamar in this slot five years from now? Is that too soon? Or do you think it's going to take his whole career because of how prolific breeze was while he played no i don't think it will take that long I, I think if we start to see some playoffs i mean if he went to super bowl obviously that that throws him further into the ring and that's been the big knock on lamar jackson right now he can put up stats he can be an mvp you know regular season quarterback but when you get to that playoff and you, when you get to the playoffs and you have to then elevate to win a super bowl that's kind of been the rub on him so if all of a sudden he can turn himself into a postseason January quarterback, February, you know, Super Bowl winner. Well, then, OK, the narrative changes. But right now he hasn't, I don't think, reached the ceiling yet where I feel like Breeze did reach his ceiling. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, though, because Breeze won uh, that Super Bowl in the 2009 season and then just never got back and really yeah. struggled in the playoffs. Um so, yeah, but I do agree the answer here is Drew Brees. Maybe Lamar passes him at some point down the road. But Brees at 32nd overall, 
all the way back in 2001 when he was the first pick of the second round because there were only 31 teams because the Texans did not exist yet. Uh, so that is how Drew Brees got taken in the second round, even though he was the 32nd overall pick. That is it. So all you made it through every pick. I'm about to lose my voice. That is the end of the show on Monday. We'll be back with our oops, all trades draft, which is just where we're going to wheel and deal and look at deals that teams should make. I think Prince will be here if he is uh, back from his vacation. Maybe he's on vacation for another two weeks. I don't know. But if you want to see Brinson Monday, leave a comment saying, I want to see Brinson or don't. I don't care, but I do want you to like, I do want you to subscribe, and I do want you to say hi to Solly in the comments. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. For Tyler Sullivan, I'm John Breach. See you guys next week.